Welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek, that is I, and Dr. Holacek, that is he. I'm here. <laughs> that's and right. That is that is he. That's right. That is he. Not that is him. You had it right. Wow. And that is Mr. Jefferson in the chair behind Dr. Holacek. <laughs> that is Jeffy for short. He's he's our um he's Get our a little best. hot for him out here, so he's oh still he's our, trying to chill. Our fan, our our uh, loyal fan. Um so this is um Thomas Jefferson to Marquis uh Marquis de Lafayette, and, and the letter dated October 9th, 1824. And before we get started, though, I'd like to go over Dr. Holacek's credentials. Um, so, and this is our 51st episode today? 51. 51. Wow. Um, okay, pretty soon our episodes will be higher than our age. <laughs> It'll take a while for me, but... Well, then, sooner uh, for me than you. <laughs> Okay, um, so Dr. Holacek is a PhD professor of philosophy and history who taught at institutions such as University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, Rutgers University, Camden, and Ohio University. He is the editor of the Journal of Thomas Jefferson and His Time and the author and editor of numerous published books on Thomas Jefferson. Um, he's written over 200 essays and his list of books and locations of his published essays can be found in the video description. Um, with our show, One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson. And um, so are you ready for the introduction? Ready. Sure. ready? Okay. So um, to give you an introduction, um, we pledged last week, and in keeping with the request from one of my friends from Twitter Spaces, um, to say something about Thomas Jefferson's relationship with Marquis de Lafayette. Um, Dr. Holacek has chosen a late in life letter from Thomas Jefferson to Lafayette. The letter is a bit bare bones, but Dr. Holacek promises to flesh out the skeleton with some amusing, amusing anecdotes about the friendship between the two from other sources. Lafayette has written to Thomas Jefferson on October 1st from Philadelphia to inform the latter of his upcoming visit to Monticello. Woo, I'm so excited. Um, I'm Donna Vitek, and this is One Work, Five Questions. Okay, question number one. Tell us about Thomas Jefferson's relationship with Lafayette. Who was Lafayette, and how did their relationship begin? Well, uh, Lafayette's real name was Marie-Joseph Paul Ives Roche Gilbert de Motier. He was born in 1757. And only as a Frenchman can you have like 15 names thrown together <laughs> and somehow it sounds pretty elegant. Um, you know, I'm glad we just call him Lafayette. Okay. He was, um, you know, Jefferson was born in 1743 and Lafayette 57. So there's an age difference of roughly 14 years between the two, Jefferson being senior. And he was an important figure in the American Revolutionary War. Um, he, as a young man, had a sort of an attraction to what the revolutionists were doing uh, in the colonies, right? And he had a, without going in through all the nuts and bolts of it, but he had a, an ardent desire to participate in the American Revolution. So he did what he could. Um, you know, when he learned about the American Revolution, learned about people like Jefferson, Patrick Henry, George Washington, um, he becomes bewitched. He wants to go to the colonies and do something, do what he can to help the American colonists succeed in their revolution. Obviously, this has to have some roots in the amaranthine, there's your word for the day, I guess, uh, amaranthine, always happening forever and ever, uh, warring between France and England over the centuries. And uh, so uh, Lafayette has uh, an investment to see the Americans win this. And uh, he's very young at the time, obviously. Um, and so he winds up going to um, Washington, I think, in Philadelphia in 1777. 
Washington is immediately smitten by the young man who is an ardent revolutionist and pledges to do what he can. Of course, Washington finds him valuable because he is a French-speaking person who has learned some English on, on the ship ride, so he can speak both languages, function as an interpreter, and perhaps rally many of the French-speaking people that are still in, you know, um, um, after the French and Indian War, who are still uh, frontiersmen in that, in, in the American frontier. So um, he also promises to go back to, to France, to Paris, and uh, spread the word about the American Revolution and bring some French soldiers with him to fight on behalf. So he becomes, in some sense, a general, and he fights in the deciding battle, right, of uh, Yorktown in the Revolutionary War as a general. And to make a long story short, I tell the story in this book, right, oh. completely story in this book, Thomas Jefferson in Paris. Okay. I right, just came out this last year. And I do have a couple of copies that I can send out for if you want an autograph copy for um, $40, including shipping. It's regularly priced 70 okay. uh, I tell the complete story over the chapters, very short chapters, a lot of pictures. Um, let's just say by the age of 24, he became he becomes the most celebrated, perhaps the most celebrated person in all of uh, Europe for his exploits. So... And then I, I would add that by the time um, Jefferson becomes minister plenipotentiary to France, 1784-1789, uh, he avails himself of Lafayette and Marquis de Condorcet, who's older than Lafayette. He avails himself of the generosity of you, what you like to call the large largesse of, uh, of the two Frenchmen who helped him, uh, him acquaint himself to the French, the Paris environment, which is strange and in many respects um, uninvitingly hostile to Jefferson because it's it's French. It's a different culture and it's right. massively large compared to any American city. So they become fast friends and uh, that's that. I mean, there's more I can say, but that's enough, I think. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, question number two. Thomas Jefferson mentions a certain Miss Wright about to visit with Lafayette. Who is she? Well, I had to do some digging on this because I had no clue who Miss Wright was. And so, you know, you, you type in her name on the Internet, didn't help much, and finally got some info on her. Um, she was born in 1795, so she's very young and dies in 1852. She is a writer. She writes several books, sort of quasi-history, as it were, commentaries on um, the American culture and so forth while she's here. And uh, she's also a playwright. And at some point in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, she sends Jefferson a copy of her play, and Jefferson thanks her for that. And she makes the acquaintance, and she's all excited that Jefferson wrote her back to acknowledge that he received the the, the little booklet uh, with her play. Wow. And uh, so she was, uh, you know, we do talk about history, um, you know, and I'm sort of interested in a lot of different female figures. She's a very interesting figure. Um, she and her sister, they were orphaned, I think, by the time that they were two, grew up in a relatively wealthy and liberal household, and grew up with sort of liberal values, and she was attracted to America uh, very early on in life. And, and she was an intellectual woman. What her education was, I don't know if she had any formal schooling, I doubt it, but, uh, other than, you know, homeschooling and so forth. But uh, she was an intellectual woman and something you weren't supposed to be doing at the time. And there was always that, you know, I won't go into all that, but she was interested in, as was Jefferson, emancipation of slaves. And there was always the thorny problem that sidetracked Jefferson and other people. Well, you have to do it the right way. Jefferson always had to say you had to emancipate them, educate them, and expatriate them. Right. And that's a tremendously large cost. Um, 
And, you, you know, so what do you do with the slaves? What happened after the Civil War is when slaves were emancipated, um, they were just freed from the Southern plantations and the Southern plantations went down the drain. You're, you know, this is where the lion's share of a plantation owner's money would have been in his slaves. And to say, OK, we're freeing all of your slaves without any sort of recompense is to invite ruin. So the Southern economy is in a shambles when there's emancipation. So she actually had what I learned a very clever proposed solution. She starts, I think it's in Tennessee. Uh, she starts her own sort of colony. Uh, she's influenced by what Robert Owen was trying to do at uh, his colony, but yeah, it's in uh, Neshoba, um, Tennessee. And uh, she proposes something I thought was really quite clever at the time, a community where slaves could work for their independence. In other words, they could put in their labor as a measure of man hours, as a measure of money. And after a certain number of man hours, a certain number of work they do, they become free. Uh -huh. So she's understanding that, you, you know, you can't just have um, freedom. You can't just emancipate without crippling an economy. So what she does is proposes a way for the slaves, in some sense, to pay their way free. And I thought it was a rather clever idea. It didn't work, but uh, it's a rather clever idea. So I know very little about her, but from what I gather, she and she travels with Jefferson, with Lafayette uh -huh. to to Monticello to visit Jefferson in 1825. Hmm. Okay. So a uh, friendship, companionship. Okay. Well, I don't know that there's a friendship between her and Jefferson, but she's traveling with Lafayette. But uh, right. that's why she, no, she is a remarkable young lady. She's much younger than Jefferson, but she shows all the signs of being a highly intelligent and remarkable woman who's an accomplished writer a poet, uh, a, a playwright, and so forth, okay. and critic. Hmm. That sounds perfect for, <laughs> for conversation for him. Um, question number three. Jefferson mentions recollection of an evening with Lafayette and other political patriots. To what is he referring? Yeah, this is in the letter. One of the reasons I picked the letter because he talks about, you know, meeting Lafayette at the University of Virginia. He talks about he says, what a history we have to run over from the evening that yourself, Moussnier, Bernot, and other patriots settled in my house in Paris, the outlines of the Constitution you wished. Um, he's referring to a meeting that occurred on August 25, uh, 1789, prior to Jefferson leaving back for Virginia. And um, Lafayette, this is when the French Revolution is going on, and Lafayette writes a panicky letter. Uh, that's not when it occurred. I, I gave you the date of the letter, August 25, Lafayette's letter to Jefferson. He writes this very panicky letter and he tells Jefferson, break all your engagements, whatever you're doing, stop what you're doing. Uh, I'm gonna bring over some eight members of the National Assembly from the various party, from the Republicans and from you know, later be called the Jacobins and then from the uh, Royalists who later be called the Fulons. And, the idea is to come towards some kind of compromise between the two political parties and work out a and try to start up a workable constitution. Right. Uh -huh. So he says, We're going to come. I'm going to be there uh, uh you know the next day at your house at 3 p.m. The others may be a little late, but we need to get this thing going. And he says, uh these gentlemen which wish to consult you and me, they will dine tomorrow at your house as mine is always full, right? You know, mine is always full. Um, I don't take that all that seriously, you know. His is always full, obviously. I, I, he means by that there are always people over there. I right. probably want a more private setting, but I think there are other reasons for bringing going to Jefferson's house. Why would you want to go to Jefferson's place? Because he's a diplomat. He's used to conciliation. He's used to taking different sorts of ideas and compromising. And he's one of the largest known people in the world when it comes to um, 
you know, his because of his declaration, and he's probably, uh, you know, affiliated with wrongfully affiliated with the Constitution, which he didn't write and stuff, and he had no very little influence on. But you know, these French patriots see him as as a hero. So if anything, he's going to have at least a calming effect on these people. Right. And presumably the letter, the panic of the letter suggests that Lafayette has tried to do this on a number of occasions and it hasn't worked. Uh, I, I can't say that specifically, but we can infer that. And the problem is, is let's go over Jefferson's house and do it over there. And it's almost like a last ditch effort to try to avert a catastrophe right without any sort of compromise the, the whole the enterprise of republican reform of government can go up in smoke and jefferson in his autobiography writes of that when we read from this he goes that night i was silent witness to a coolness and candor of argument unusual in the conflicts of political opinion to a logical reasoning and chaste eloquence disfigured by no gaudy tinsel of rhetoric or declamation, unlike what we get today, <laughs> rhetoric and declamation, and truly worthy of being placed in parallel with the finest dialogues of antiquity as handed to us by Xenophon, by Plato, by Cicero. Cicero, great orator. The result was an agreement that the king should have a suspension, a suspensive veto on the laws and that the legislator should be composed of a single body only that to be chosen by the people. So we've got some you know, you know, compromises going on. This uh, concordate decided the fate of the constitution. The patriots all rallied to the principle thus settled, carried every question agreeably to them and reduced the aristocracy to insignificance and impotence. So the problem is are we gonna have possibility of a government by the people? Are we going to have aristocracy and king in place again with the king and the king's powerful people, his wife and uh, and so forth, and, and, and intimate counselors running the state of affairs for all people? So he talks of this, you know, and he, he mentions that he was a neutral, impassive observer. Now, I'll say one thing be before we go on to the next question. Was Jefferson a neutral, passive observer, I think he was. Because if, you've been, uh, if you ever watch French TV, if you've been, a, been around French persons in conversation, it's a very beautiful, fluid language, but it's often also spoken quickly. Uh -huh. And I know French and I have a hard time following spoken French dialogue sometimes when it's done very quickly. So one can imagine that Jefferson was a neutral passive observer. His French was good, but it was far from perfect. I make that claim in this wonderful book, right, <laughs> Jefferson. And I suspect that Jefferson could not follow the whole conversation, did, did not know what was going on a lot of the time. Uh, he caught phrases and words here and there so he could get perhaps the gist of it. So it was easy for him to be neutral in passive, right? Which would have been his proper role. Okay, so he's playing on the wild gesticulating, uh, the animation, the forbearance, the conciliation that's going on in the room, um, a lot of the psychology of the speaking and not, not necessarily the essence of what was going on, uh, which was certainly explained to him at the end of the day. So they are drinking <laughs> wine from, from uh, uh, was it three o'clock? I think till ten o'clock at night and Ooh. discussing <laughs> issues. But but here again, you know what's significant here is we have one of the most important dis, uh, dinners in the history of the modern world going on, and Jefferson's right at the center. <laughs> Hard to believe, right? Yeah. Imagine no. being a fly on the wall at that dinner, where people, French people, are discussing the fate of a nation. It's a dinner party where the whole nation, the fate of the nation is in some sense at stake. Pretty cool stuff. Wow. Yeah, that is. Oh, I, I would like to be there. <laughs> oh, and Jefferson. Oh, he's so cute. He's in the background paying attention. <laughs> he's such it's a good too student. hot for him to do anything. He's a uh, good student. He's sitting quietly, just paying attention to daddy. 
He's so he's sweet. Got to be on the show. That's it. He's a hot yeah. He makes call. the show. I mean, yes, he's he's our Doge for the show. Do you accept Doge payments and for the book? <laughs> oh, certainly. We have to we have to get you a, a crypto wallet set up so you can accept Doge payments for. That's for just <laughs> more to scare me. More technology. In my, in my old age and my dotage. Oh, cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never thought, huh? Um, question number four. If Thomas Jefferson was mostly neutral and passive, he was still in contravention of his duties as minister plenipotentiary to France, was he not? Yeah, and, and that's the problem. Um, and he knew it. He is minister plenipotentiary, he has no business in getting involved in French affairs, the affairs of the French nation as minister plenipotentiary. He is empowered exclusively to discuss treaties, for example, between France and the United States and their foreign affairs, their relationship and so forth. But here we have a dinner that involves Frenchmen discussing and arguing with other Frenchmen and it's at his place. Um, he has no business doing that. He's contravening his own affairs. And Jefferson knew that. He, he sort of woke up panicked uh, the next day. And, uh, you know, um, who was it? The Count de Mont Morin um, found out about Jefferson. And Jefferson, you know, he, Jefferson went up and discussed that with him. I know I'm not supposed to be doing this. Yeah, Mont Montmorin. He said, no, I'm not supposed to be doing this. He just says, I want you to know that this is what happened at my place. And Montmorin says, yeah, well, I know that this went on and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. It, it, what that suggests is that even though it's contravention of, 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 of his role as, a, as a, a foreign minister, this person has such trust in Jefferson's discretion, so he's not worried about it. Now, we talk about why it's so important for Lafayette to have the dinner at Jefferson's place. I already suggested the problem with that might be Jefferson is a global symbol of liberty and freedom. Right. And just to have him in the room will be a calming presence. To have it as his residence is even goes a step further. It, it, uh, it, in effect, it's to say, okay, we're going to have it at this great statesman for global, for, for American liberty, and we're going to have it not only with him, but at his place, right? Um, and Lafayette saying, mine is, my place is always full. I don't believe that at all. He could have arranged so that, but he wants, he's desperate and he wants a change of venue here. Uh, now, so the other question to answer is that if he, why does Jefferson accept? Because there are other proposals that were political in nature that Jefferson rejected, and they, claiming that this goes beyond my ken and my duties um, uh, as a, an American minister plenipotentiary. Um, one answer is that Lafayette's a very dear friend, and Lafayette is writing with a great deal of urgency. Um, he writes, he says, if they don't agree in a few days, we shall have no great majority in favor of any plan and it must end in a war, Lafayette writes. And he says, I beg for liberty's sake, you break every engagement to give us a dinner tomorrow, when, when as day, doesn't spell it, you know. Um, if we look at the writing, it, it doesn't seem, um, that he's offering Jefferson any option. I beg it. It's almost like, okay, I'm going to be there tomorrow at three o'clock. <laughs> you know, you better be there. And these men are going to be coming up probably a little later. So we need to have a dinner. Um, and, you know, the other obvious reason is that Jefferson was intoxicated by the notion of, uh, of the contagion of the American sense of liberty in the continental United States. And, it being contagious in France. And he thought that if the contagion, you know, carries in France, it, it might spread to other nations around and all of Europe will be 
Jeffersonian Republican. So even though he's violating his duties as a minister, um, he does so in some sense willingly, both from a sense of duty and a sense of perhaps no alternative to being no alternative. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Jefferson's snoring right now. Oh, little Jeffy? I'm, I'm, oh. He's snoring while I'm managing my beard from oh. having yet any offers from my beard manager. Your beard manager. Do you have a patent on it yet? <laughs> I don't give up on things that are worthwhile. I do love this little item. It really works beautifully for my beard. Oh. Gets the badgers and other creatures out of there, the bats and whatever, the field mice that come into my beard, it clears them right out. And field mice? Just <laughs> like that. That's, well, you, you missed the badgers and bats, didn't you? <laughs> all right. I, I got the field mice. <laughs> all right. Oh, okay. Question number five. Um, Thomas Jefferson in, in the letter invites Lafayette to be the first guest at the University of Virginia. That That is about what? Yeah, I, again, that's what's nice about the letter. It refers to several different events, some of which have occurred already, one of which is his trip to Charlottesville, what's about to occur uh, from November 4 to November 15. Um, Lafayette comes to Charlottesville, so he's going to spend a decent amount of time, 11 days, you know, with, in the company of Thomas Jefferson. Wow. And... Um, we have in Sarah Randolph's book an account, and I'll read this to you when Lafayette, imagine, so these people have roots all the way back to the American Revolution. The French helped the Americans win the war. Jefferson forms a, for, a close bond. That bond gets larger. It's Jefferson is governor of uh, Virginia in, in 17, what, um, 1779, 1781. It gets greater when Jefferson goes 1785, 1789 to Paris. And then they don't see each other after the Paris days for 1779 till, uh, what is it here, 1824. So 79, it's uh, 35 years, right? Wow. And 40, yeah, 35 years or so, if I get the math correct, 24. Yeah, maybe more than that. Uh, so grandson, Jefferson's favorite grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph gives this account and I'll, I'll read from it. So Lafayette's carriage is arriving. He says the lawn on the east side of, of at Monticello contains not quite an acre. On this spot was the meeting of Jefferson and Lafayette on the latter's visits to the United States. The barouche containing Lafayette stopped at the edge of the lawn his escort, 120 mounted men, so you've got this parade of 120 mounted men wow. formed on one side in a semicircle, extending from the carriage to the house, right? Sort of drawing the two together in the semicircle, together by curiosity to witness the meeting of these two venerable men, form themselves in a semicircle on the opposite side. So you, the two men are sort of encircled by men, right? Uh, as Lafayette descended from the carriage, Jefferson descended the steps of the portico. The scene which followed was touching. Jefferson was feeble and tottering with age. Lafayette permanently lamed and broken in health by his long confinement in the dungeon of Almutz. As they approached each other, their uncertain gait quickened itself into a shuffling run and exclaiming, ah, Jefferson, ah, Lafayette. They burst into tears and fell into each other's arms. Among the 400 men witnessing the scene, there was not a dry eye. No sound save an occasional suppressed sob. The two old men entered the house as the crowd dispersed in profound silence. So you have to understand, you know, the people around Charlottesville, uh, for the most part, outside of people that might be affiliated later with the university, are not intellectuals, but they know a little bit, a smattering about American history. They know that this great, great Frenchman, uh, one of the great um, revolutionists in French history, is coming to visit this great man from Charlottesville. Um, the story someone tells about um, Jefferson um, 
someone in Charlottesville, people were talking about, yeah, we know Thomas Jefferson was a great man and president. He wrote a book. We don't know anything about the book. You know, so I mean, that's how people were. It's, oh, this great man lives in Charlottesville. And, you know, he was vice president and president. Uh, you know anything about him? Not really. So, uh, <laughs> so idea, the, the idea is you got all these people together just to witness. And this is two of the great people on the planet of the time getting together and meeting again for the last time. And you can see that people were crying. People were just, and everything becomes, the carriage comes up. There's a lot of bustle and noise, people talking. And as soon as Lafayette descends from his carriage in Jefferson from the portico, everything is quiet because no one wants to miss anything. Perfectly quiet. You can hear a pin drop as it were. So there is later this gala dinner uh, at the newly constructed University of Virginia. And again, um, I'll read from a speech that Jefferson writes. It's quite beautifully constructed. Jefferson does not have the, the, the valve, the energy to give the speech. So he hands it to Val Southall to read. But there's this gala dinner to sort of, and, and, and Lafayette's the first person, the real person to visit the University of Jefferson. So proud of it. They're having a gala dinner. And who else is there? Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. Oh, wow. So you've got three presidents at the university with Lafayette there. So you can imagine, you know, if you can get book your ticket for this dinner, you're going to do so. This is one of the great, enormous events of your lifetime. So you can, uh, one of my, this is one of my favorite stories about Jefferson because uh, it shows you just how much he was loved by others, um, by Lafayette and um, what an appreciation he had in the service of liberty is as you like to call it, large largesse, is generosity. And same with, so the speech goes like this, and I'll end it with this. Um, I joy, my friends, in your joy, inspired by the visit of this, our ancient and distinguished leader and benefactor. His deeds in the War of Independence you have heard and read. They're known to you and embalmed in your memories and in the pages of faithful history. His deeds in the peace which followed that war are perhaps not known to you, but I could attest to them. So he's talking about, you know him as a great general in the American Revolution and his own, but, you know, these are not, this is a person who, whose deeds go beyond just being a fighter, a general. He worked hard in peacetime. Um, when I was stationed in his country for the purpose of cementing its friendship with ours and of advancing our mutual interests, this friend of both um, was my most powerful auxiliary and advocate. Very strong statement. He made her cause his own, as in truth, it was that of his native country also. His influence and connections there were great. All doors of all departments were open to him at all times, to me only formally and at appointed times. Uh, this is, uh, the, he says, in truth, I held the nail, he drove it. Honor him then as your benefactor in peace as well as in war. And uh, I don't have to tell you that Jefferson was a brilliant writer and he knew how to give a short, very, very powerful speech to talk about how uh, Jefferson downplays his own significance. I am only the person who holds the nail, he drives it in. So it's a very beautiful um, speech that he gives that's written by South Hall. And, and that, in effect, sort of sums, you know, what I wanted to say about Thomas Jefferson and Marquis de Lafayette. There's so much more to, about which we could talk, but that gets at the gist of, uh, oh, I well, hope. Uh, we can always do another show on um, on their relationship. It sounds like something that would be very positive. Something more particular, focusing yeah. on one of the particulars. Here's the sort of like a general introduction. And it, yeah, same. we could use the stuff. positive relationship in our society <laughs> right now we don't um, focus historians don't focus on anything positive anymore we're so you know we're so intrigued by tearing things to shreds 
to shredding yeah. things. And, uh, you know, as great philosophers all know, it's very easy to be a skeptical philosopher, to take something someone else has written and, and destroy it. Uh, you know, it's hard to replace it with something better, right? It's very easy to look at Plato or Aristotle's system or Epicurus' or Kant's system or Hume's system and say it doesn't work. What are you going to do to replace it? Okay, right. do you have any options instead of just being completely skeptical? And right. Jefferson was that optimistic person in our time. That's why he was so loved. Mm -hmm. And always be loved in spite of the bullshit today because he was an optimist. In spite of the fact that there was a lot of bad going on in his time, he had faith in all of us. Right. And you know what? And he was, and I think he was right because everything that he wanted to accomplish, um, moving that he hoped we would accomplish after his time, we did um, the, the, the main thing. So, um, so if you would like to um, contact Dr. Holacek to order his book, um, The Thomas Jefferson in Paris, you can reach him at mholacek at hotmail.com. That's M-H-O-L-O-W-C-H-A-K at hotmail.com or on Twitter at um, with the at sign Dr. Holacek or his Facebook page, Thomas Jefferson, Bring Him Home to Monticello, Citizens for Change. So what do we have next week? What's next episode? Well, I would add before we go to next week, if, if you're not, if, if you want a copy of this book, it's a beautiful book, by the way. I love writing it. You'll, I promise you, you'll enjoy it. Uh, if you're not interested, I, I can give you my autograph. Or if you're more interested, you can have Jeffy's ink <laughs> paw print. Jeff, I'll buy it for Jeffy's paw print. <laughs> That's what I figured. The, uh, He's sort of a silent, uh, but anyway, next time we're going to go to a 1785 letter to nephew Peter Carr, who was in, for all intents and purposes at the time, Jefferson's son, because Carr's father, Dabney, had died uh, years ago, and Jefferson brought the Carrs in to live with them, right? That's what people sort of did at the time. We wouldn't think yeah. of doing that today. So he brings yeah. his nephew in, and he's in Paris. And he writes uh, the first of two letters. There's another letter of 1787 about his education. So he's he liked Peter Carr um, quite a bit. And he's interested in overseeing his education, if only from a distance. So you have a very extraordinarily long letter that talks about his education, about reason in the moral sense. So okay. we'll turn that next week. Well, if you enjoyed today's episode, please like and share um, on YouTube and, and any of your other social networks. And thank you um, for the people who joined us on Twitter Spaces. We have Doge Mart, who makes homemade uh, dog chews. And I'm waiting for mine in the mail for Baker. Um, and 